Good evening and welcome to the Pope Paul VI Learning Resource Center at the Catholic University of Eastern Africa. My name is James Smart of NTV. And I am Sophia Wanuna of KTN News. Welcome to the second and last of two debates between the running mates of the four presidential candidates cleared to run for president in the forthcoming election. This is the fourth of six national televised debates organized through a joint media presidential debates initiative bringing together literally the entire Kenyan media fraternity. The candidates participating in the debate have agreed to the rules and guidelines requiring them to conduct themselves with utmost decorum, address each other with respect, and extend honor to viewers watching this debate live across all Kenya's broadcast media platforms. Indeed, and the candidates in the debate have also agreed to adhere to the allocated time. Each candidate has two minutes to make an opening statement, two minutes to answer a question, and um, 60 seconds for a rebuttal. The topics have carefully been selected after a thorough assessment of the state of our nation and the sentiments of the regular Kenyan voters in various parts of this country. In line with the debate rules and the best practices, the questions we shall ask have not been shared with any of the campaign teams, neither were they discussed or formulated in conjunction with anyone. The questions are entirely our own. And an invited audience here, seated in the auditorium, has also agreed to the debate rules. They have been fully briefed that cheers, jeers, or any other form of noise is not permitted during the debate. We have a make the exception now, as we request the audience to help us warmly welcome Honorable Martha Karua and Honorable Rigadi Gashagwa to the stage. Karibuni sana, Honorable Rigadi Gashagwa occupying podium one in order of that balloting exercise we just witnessed a few moments ago. Uh, you have heard the rules of the debate and we look, to a fruitful, look forward to a fruitful engagement this evening. We'll begin with your opening statement, Mr. Gashagwa, in two minutes. Thank you. My name is Rigadi Gashagwa, born and brought up in the slopes of Mount Kenya, Herega village 57 years ago. Family is the basic unit of society and the nation. Strong families make strong nations. I'm the head of a family, and it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce my family tonight, who are here with me. My wife of 35 years, Pastor Dokas Wanjiko Rigadi, and my firstborn son, Kevin Gashagwa, a software engineer, and my secondborn son, Dr. Keith Ikino, a medical doctor, who helps me to run family business. Tonight is a defining moment for the people of Kenya. The people of Kenya are in anguish. They are in a state of helplessness. They have no food. They don't know where to get their next meal. They are devastated. They need hope. Tonight, I'll present the Kenya Kwanzaa plan on how we intend to turn around the economy of this country, put people uh, where they belong, restore their dignity, put money in their pocket, and allow them to enjoy their dignity. I look forward to a very objective debate, no trivialities, issues, 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 so that the people of Kenya have an opportunity to interrogate what we plan to do for them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gashagwa. Madam Martha Karua Karibu, now your two minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Sophia. I was born and brought up in Kirinyaga, and I want to thank my parents, who are still alive, thank God, for instilling the values of honesty, hard work, community, and respect, values that hold good to this day. In this debate and in the audience, I have my family, my two children, Wawira and Edward, my grandchildren, four of them, 
my brothers and sisters, some of them, others are online. I represent the Azimio hope for this country. Azimio, together with Kenyans of goodwill, is out to rescue this country from the stranglehold of corruption cartels. This country can't breathe. We cannot get the services that people do require because monies intended for public service are going into the pockets of corruption cartels who then become instant millionaires with huge bank balances. We intend to help this country, to help citizens get their country back and all the resources of this country will be utilized for the best interest of the entire nation, not a select few. I am here to discuss those issues and I am glad that my opponent is also talking of issues which is what we have been calling for in our campaign. I'm able, ready, and willing. Thank you very much, candidates, for your opening statements. Let's introduce the elephant in the room and start this debate. The question of the deputy president. It has dominated public consciousness in the last five years. I'll start with you, Honorable Rigadi Gashagwa. What kind of a deputy president will you be? You have two minutes. I come from a background of management. I have been in public service for 15 years. I've been in private sector for 15 years. I've been in legislation for five years. That gives a 35-year experience of public service and engaging with the people. I am a hard-working man. I'm very passionate. I have zeal to serve. I'm an active man. I wake up early. I don't take alcohol. I have all the time and the commitment to put my all to serve the people of Kenya. I have a very good idea of what I need to do to assist my candidate, Dr. William Bruto, in the management of the affairs of this country, give him backup, be available, move around the country to implement development programs, listen to the people, be available to the people, because we have the bottom-up economic model. It's about the people. If you have noted, we have gone around the country in all the 47 counties and held economic forums, listened to the people, had very extensive consultative process of what the people of Kenya want from us. And that informed our manifesto. And we were not surprised that critics were saying our manifesto is too detailed and meticulous. It had to be because it had to capture the issues, the aspirations of the Kenyan people what they want us to do for them. And our manifesto is a clear plan that is informed by what the people of Kenya want us to do for them to dignify them, to improve their quality of life, and to give them a chance to prevail and be men and women of substance. Thank you. Honorable Karua, the same question. What kind of a deputy president will you be? I'll be a deputy president who is respectful of the constitution of the people of Kenya, of my principal, and a person who will obey the rule of law and do the best to support my captain to deliver for this country. The oath of office dictates that the interests of the public are paramount in everything a government does. I will help my captain to stick to the rule of law to ensure that what is in the Constitution is fulfilled. Our Constitution dictates that we adopt a social market economy where social justice is in the forefront. That is why Article 57, uh, Article 47, 46, not 47, talks of socioeconomic rights. You will notice that in our manifesto, we are talking about giving social support to those who cannot have any income, who do not at the moment have any income. And that's one way of fulfilling the promise of the Constitution and ensuring that Kenyans live in dignity, especially those who cannot afford the basics of life. 
I will therefore serve with honesty, and my track record speaks of that, that I have been a consistent public servant who does her work in the manner prescribed by the law, with honesty, with dedication. I will devote 100% to the people of Kenya. All right. The question on the deputy president, we, it's public domain, that the current president and his deputy are reading from two different scripts. In the last five years, we've seen that effect in public domain. If that happens, what is your view? How should that be solved? How should that be sorted? Uh, in my case, and Dr. William Ruto, that will not happen. Both of us are strong-willed leaders who respect each other. None of us suffers from inferiority complex. At no time will William Ruto ever punish me or mistreat me because he has no reason to. I'll support him to be president, and he'll reciprocate that support. Between me and him, we are in agreement that we have no time to quarrel or disagree. We are inheriting a dilapidated country, an economic, a, a country that is on knees economically, a country that is facing an economic shutdown. We have no time for sideshows. We have no time for personal differences. We have no time for an inferiority complex and competition that is unnecessary. We have a job to do. We are inheriting a nine trillion debt. We are inheriting six million young people who have no jobs. 14 million Kenyans are in CRB. We have such a huge task ahead of us that it is unimaginable that Dr. William Ruto or Rigadi Gashagua would digress on personal issues and petty matters to disagree at all. Each of us has a job well cut out. I have already been assigned to work on the economy. I have gone around the country listening to the people of Kenya. I have been to each and every county, and I brought those views that informed our manifesto. Going forward on election, our job is well cut out from day one. We have to implement our plan that is ready, and we have no time to disagree, to quarrel, to have different opinions. We are too busy to even imagine that we can disagree on any issue. We are brought together by a convergence that we need to serve the people of Kenya. And both of us love the people of Kenya and the ordinary people. And Honorable Karu, as I come to you, I mean, at the beginning of the presidency now, as we have it in 2013, it would have been unimaginable that would be today witnessing the kind of fallout we are between the president and his deputy. So for you, how do you execute differently and ensure we do not see this kind of bad blood drawn out? I think even when people have differences, because it is not possible for human beings to always think alike. That's why even our constitution acknowledges diversity of opinion. It is imperative that all debates or disagreements or arguments on issues happen in-house, and what is brought to the public must be the result, the agreement on the positions. And I think I'm very well prepared, and I'll continue to pray and address my mind that, one, the overall leader is the president. I am the principal assistant. With that in mind, that I'm a delegate of the president and can be required to do any work to support the presidency and the administration, I'll be ready, and I am ready. I have served as a cabinet minister for six and a half years. A cabinet minister is the delegate of the president. A deputy president is a first among equals within cabinet in being a delegate of the president. It's not a different position. We will be able to moderate any differences of opinion on any issues and to focus on serving Kenyans and to be respectful to Kenyans arguing in public, calling each other names in public, is not only a disgrace, it's also not respecting Kenyans who elected and put us in office. Yeah. So I will be very conscious, and I've been commenting on the current situation, which does not commend itself to anyone. Would you then perhaps 
going by the experience this country has gone through. In terms of the architecture of the con Constitution, should we have a rethink, perhaps from an elective deputy president to an appointive one, so that if things do not work out for the sake of country, then the president has that latitude? Two minutes. Nothing wrong with the architecture of the Constitution, something wrong with our behavior. It is not that we need to amend to prescribe the relationship between the president and a deputy president. It is that we need to change our behavior, differ with respect, give, de uh, maintain deference for people who are above us, that even when you differ, the way you address them is in a way that tomorrow you can be able to once again sit and work together. And when it comes to my opponent saying that their manifesto or their plan was discussed by Kenyans, I want to remind Kenyans, Azimio was a product of a robust discussion, way ahead of anything our opponents have done. And my captain went around the country and he got Kenyans to express themselves and that's how Azimio was born. That's how the agenda, the manifesto was born. Consultative process as prescribed by the Constitution. We intend to continue with consultations, even in governance, because public participation is deeply embedded in the Constitution, which my principal and I fought so hard to put in place. All right, right. Honorable Guy, the same question. Supposing this were to happen, we've seen before, and it's been part of our history, people call themselves brothers and friends, and then they have a fallout. Supposing this were to happen, would you think it would be possible and great for us to have the deputy president be an appointive position so that the president has the leeway essentially to fire you? That is a hypothesis. Uh, I like to look at life from a positive, positive perspective. I always look at a glass as half full, not half empty. I have no doubt in my mind that we are a formidable pair. We are a pair that has been brought together by a common convergence to serve the people of Kenya, to spearhead, chaperon, and implement the third liberation. That is the economic liberation for the people of Kenya. And what has brought us together is so important that no side shows can come in between. Uh, the focus that is before us, the need to restore the dignity of the Kenyan people, is such an important aspect of our lives, of our leadership, that it is incomprehensible that we could think of having side shoes and things that are necessary. And by the way, the situation between President Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto has not been brought because of ideological differences. It has been brought because of an inferiority complex. Right. People must allow strong leaders to prevail. And you shouldn't have a problem when your deputy is strong and sharp and focused. You should just be able to accommodate him and use that as a strength to serve the people of Kenya. Had President Huru Kenyatta in the second term allowed William Ruto to help him manage the affairs of this country, we will not be where we are today, where Kenyans have no food, where Unga is at 250 shillings, that they have to run around to look for a package to try to deal with it to save this election on their part. If he had allowed Dr. William Ruto to help him like in the first term, all the, st all the stored projects will be going on he should have used the strength of William Ruto and harness it and use it to argument his leadership and to strengthen it for the benefit of the people of Kenya. However, um, Honorable Rigadi, just quickly to follow up on that, we have seen Martha Karua in 2009, it was, resign after they disagreed with the president as a minister. You saw the former deputy governor, Nairobi, when they could not work with the governor, again, resign. So isn't it on principle that those who push for, if it doesn't work out? I don't think it is honorable to be a quitter. I think you must fight from within and uh, pursue what you intended to do. When the Nairobi deputy governor quit, he left a vacuum in Nairobi, and that allowed President Huru Kenyatta to bring the military into the city, you know? Because if he was there, the mess in Nairobi will not be. You cannot be a quitter. You must fight on. My sister, Mother Karova, 
quit President Mwai Kibaki's government when Kibaki needed him, when Kibaki was in trouble, when Raila Odinga was making life impossible for him. <laughs> Mwai Kibaki needed Mother Karua. And at a time when Mother Karua needed to assist Mwai Kibaki, she quit. Mwai Kibaki is and has been the gentleman of Kenyan's politics, a namiable old man, a good man, a respectable man, a man who was listening to everybody. Any leader who could not work with Mwai Kibaki, I have serious doubt that leader can work with anybody else. Um, just All a quick right. reminder to the audience. In the auditorium, we did agree to a set of rules. Silence, please. No laughing, cheering, jeering. Let's just follow the conversation to allow us to have civil engagement and for uh, understanding and hearing every of the candidates as they articulate their thoughts. Thank you very much, Mother Karua. Response? For those who do not for understand principle, they can never envisage resigning. But I do think it is dishonest to continue to take public salary, to take the privilege and all that goes with office when you know you can no longer deliver, either because of differences or because of other things. I respectively withdrew myself by resignation from Waikibaki's government in a respectful manner, no name calling, such that we were able to continue when we meet to sit down and talk. I don't think the same can be said of Mr. Kashagwa's princip uh, uh, principle. Entertaining disagreement outside government and publicly is disruptive. No wonder the government in which Mr. Kashagwa's principle serves is unable to fight corruption because it's pulling in two different directions. That is why we have a paralysis today. Honorable uh, Martha Karua, the question on just what happens if you disagree with your principle and if your principle should have the right to essentially let you go, should we relook at that? I think the way the Constitution is, you disagree in house, you resolve it. I do not think there is anything that cannot be resolved unless if it's something that is unconstitutional, that is being demanded of me. I will remember the oath, my oath under the Constitution that there are things, if they are outrightly illegal, I certainly cannot be party to. But happily, my principle is a believer in the rule of law and constitutionalism. And he is also a man who views everything through the lens of social justice. That is why we have a dignity package for those who cannot afford meals on their table. That is why we have Babacare to rescue Kenyans from lack of access to medical services. If you look at our agenda, you will see that this is an, ange an agenda that talks of the socio-economic rights of Kenyans, an inclusive agenda that has every Kenyan, whether poor or rich, as demanded by our constitution. So I cannot stand here and honestly say that we shall have the same position on all things. That never happened, not even in Mwai Kibaki's government. But in six and a half years which I served, I never publicly berated the government that I served or the president that I served. I just said my hands were tied and I withdrew. My principle differed with Mwai Kibaki, but all he said to the public is that I was not consulted. How they went back room and resolved, we never know. We only know they came out with a unanimous decision. That is what people who have respect for the public do. People who have respect for their offices do. But holding an office while not serving is dishonesty. Honorable Kashagwa, uh, the same question, I realized didn't respond the last time. Should this position of deputy president be an appointive position? No. In fact, the framers of the Constitution were very clear that a deputy president needed to enjoy mandate directly from the people. Why Azimio cannot push William Ruto to resign is because William Ruto is not an appointee of President Uhuru Kenyatta. He is elected by the people of Kenya. If it was the previous Constitution, William Ruto would have been sacked a long time ago and replaced with Gideon Moy. And that was a plan. The plan was to provoke him, intimidate him, humiliate him, persecute him, 
and his friends and his allies so that he could quit government and allow President Uhuru Kenyatta to appoint somebody from a family that they share the same issues and the same values. But because William Ruto was elected, he was able to hold on to his position. And he continued serving the people of Kenya when he was assigned duties by the president. The duty he has been allocated all the time without failure is to welcome the president and the Nyaya National Stadium. And he has done it in style because that is the duty has been allocated. He has gone ahead to chair IBEC because that one, the president cannot deny him. It is there in the PMF Act. There's nothing the president would have done. But the president chose not to allocate him duties. And the president has been crying that since he did not allocate him duties, his government has come to a halt. And nothing is going on. But he made a bed, he must lie on it. If you decide to chase your deputy away, a man who works hard, a man who knows what he's doing, and replace him with your friends, and then the country uh, comes to a halt, you cannot go ahead crying that you have nobody to help you. He made that decision for his own reason. He wanted to push Ruto out, but, the, but Dr. Ruto stayed on because he enjoys a mandate from the people of Kenya. All right, Honorable Gashagwa, Honorable Karua, I want us to move to the next topic this evening, leadership and integrity, fitness uh, to hold office. I will begin with you, Honorable Karua, and in 2013, when you vied for presidency, you said, I do not share any values with the Prime Minister, then Raila Odenga, nor do I share his politics. Both he and the late Kibaki have been unable to root out corruption within their ranks. What has changed now that you're deputizing him? Indeed, the coalition government was unable to root out corruption in the second half. And I said so publicly many times. Raila Odinga was a presidential candidate in 2013. I too was a presidential candidate. My statement that they were unable to fight corruption did not indicate they are the ones individually perpetuating corruption. It meant there was corruption in government which they failed to act on. I believe that a combined ticket of Raila Odinga Martha Karua will do the best to fight corruption. The first I resigned part. on principle because one of the things I felt la let down on is the failure to tackle issues of graft. Raila was a prime minister, a co-principal, the president, the late president Kibaki was the first among equals as the president. Whatever dynamics, I do not know of. But it is recalled that shortly after that election, I worked with Raila. Na Kenya and I were friends of NASA, not NASA, of CORD. And we worked together until 2017 when I decided to run for governor and supported Jubilee. We have been able to work together, we have a history of working together in our 30 years of being in active politics. And I know that his policies align with mine. I did mention that we both view our actions through the lens of social justice. And yeah. that is what has drawn me to work with him. Just a quick one minute, I will add you on your time, that when you said I do not share any values, you've addressed the issue of corruption and graft but you do not any, share any values and even agree on his brand of politics. What do you say to that? Because values, this is... As of that time, I felt I did not share anything with him. And remember, we were candidates. There is no way you will praise the other candidate. But I can assure you that it is not because I thought he personally was responsible for any wrongdoing, nor did I feel that President Kibake was personally responsible, but there were rogues within government they failed to act on. And I felt my hands were tied in the performance of my duties. And therefore, as I campaigned for myself, I actually was saying, look, you've been unable to fight corruption. Just like the Jubilee administration under President Uhuru Kenyatta and Dr. William Ruto. And they are still in government together up to now. And we saw Dr. Ruto attending cabinet a week ago. They've been unable to fight corruption. You can't hold one side of government and say the good one is mine 
and the bad one belongs to the other person. That's double speak. Honorable okay. Kashagwa, just a moment. Sir. I think uh, Honorable Mother needs to come through to the people of Kenya on being consistent. Honorable Mother is on record saying that Raila Odinga and President Uhuru Kenyatta should retire together. Not a long time ago. She seems to have changed her mind that they should retire together. In fact, that uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta should continue governing through proxy and Raila Odinga should purport to govern as a proxy of Uhuru Kenyatta. At what time did she meet of Raila Odinga? She's a project of Uhuru Kenyatta. The two people she said they should retire together, she seems to have changed her mind. And it is my considered opinion, and I believe for many Kenyans, that being consistent is very important in leadership, especially the position she aspires. You need to be consistent. When you say this today, you must be able to live to it tomorrow. All right. I, I want to allow Martha to respond to that, but first I want to come back to you to give you another minute. A moment ago, you said that Gideon Moe was supposed to be appointed. I want you to clear that up because, with all fairness, Gideon Moe is not on this debate. Well, President Uhuru Kenyatta, the chairman of Azimio, in a meeting in State House a week ago, said that he nominated Mother Karoa as his running mate to take care of his interests and that of his family. The president was on record, which means that Mother Karoa is a project of the chairman of Azimio, President Uhuru Kenyatta, and they are both proxies with Raila Odinga. It is not me who said, it's President Uhuru Kenyatta who said. And previously I thought that Honorable Mother had been nominated as running mate by Raila Odinga. But here comes President Uhuru Kenyatta, outgoing president, chairman of, chairman of Azimio, a man who has said he's going nowhere, he's going to be around. He'll be ruling from home. He'll be consorting his project from home. He'll be continuing to govern the people of Kenya. I, I simply do not understand. Is Mother Karua, the honorable the member, is she the, the deputy uh, is, she the deputy, is she the running mate of Raila Odinga, the project, or is she the running mate of Uhuru Kenyatta, the project master? Okay. She's who's running mate. Okay, Martha Karua is in, in the it building. It is true that both I and my captains are projects, but projects of the people of Kenya, whom my captain consulted, and by public demand, he was called upon to take leadership. At a time our country desperately needs leadership. He has offered leadership, and I was competitively selected. And like my friend who was handpicked, I faced an interviewing panel, and also through demands of Kenyans and many endorsements, I was selected. Kenyans know I'm competent, and I believe I'm competent for this job. I'm ready, able, and willing. I have consistently shown independence of mind, irrespective of whom I'm dealing with. I will handle this job independently and with commitment to Kenyans. And I know my principal also, who has been a teacher of politics to uh, Mr. Kashagwa's principal. All right, Martha Karwa, just a direct question to respond to Honorable Kashagwa. What is the role of President Uru Kenyatta in Azimio? The role of President Kenyatta, he is the chairman of the council, but my captain is the chairman, overall chairman of Azimio. Jubilee is just one out of the 26 political parties. I sit in the council as well, and President Kenyatta does not make decisions alone. It will, is he have a, will he have a role? Will he have a role after he finishes his term? Sorry? Will President Kenyatta have a role after he finishes his term? His party will have a role. And if he continues to be, if he doesn't give the, his position in the council to any other member of his party, it would be a, a peripheral role as a member of the party. The incoming ad administration will be a Raila Odinga Azimio presidency. Just like the current Jubilee government, although Uhuru was a deputy president in the government of Mwai Kibaki. It was not a continuation of the Mwai Kibaki administration. It was an Uhuru Jubilee administration. Anybody who understands government would know that. Honorable Kashago, you have a minute to respond. The truth of the matter is that the role of President Uhuru Kenyatta in Azimio is to craft his own succession 
to continue governing Kenya through proxy, through Raila Odinga and Mada Karua. President Uhuru Kenyatta has already started assigning roles to Honorable Mother Karua, which means he is a leader and in the unfortunate and unlikely event that they are elected to office, President Uhuru Kenyatta will continue governing this country outside his constitutional mandate because there is a two-term there is a two -term limit that the president should retire. But the president does not intend to retire. You saw how angry he was, saying that people are asking him to go home and asking where he's going. It looks like he doesn't remember that when he sought to be president for 10 years, he knew what 10 years is all about. He cannot complain that people are asking him to go. Nobody is asking him to go, it's the Constitution. But he's trying to circumvent the Constitution to plant a proxy government to continue governing from outside state house through Raida Odinga and Mada Karua so that he can continue protecting state capture and conflict of interest. And Mada Karua has already been assigned that role. He was on record that she is the one he has put there deliberately to protect his interests and that of his family. All right, Mada Karua. It is important to be truthful in this debate. President Kenyatta has not publicly or privately assigned me any role. I'm sure he knows that he cannot assign any role to a minister in an administration he does not have. The person who has signed, assigned me a role as deputy and has declared intention to appoint me as Minister for Justice and Constitutional Affairs, apart from being Deputy President, is the Right Honorable Raila Amolo Odinga. The, my colleagues and his captains beef with the President should not make them use this forum or use us as candidates to fight the President. We represent the aspirations of Kenyans and yes, Kenya needs rescue, but rescue from corruption cartels, which my colleague may know more about. Um, on the 6th of June, Honorable Gashagwa, during a Meet the People tour in your constituency, uh, that's Madeira uh, constituency, the people you represent there, you said that because you perceive the matter you're currently in court over to be a political witch hunt, if elected, You'd see to it that your accounts are unfrozen, build a mansion, and perhaps uh, go ahead and throw a party, in essence. Mr. Gashagwa, isn't this tantamount to subversion of the cause of justice and admission that you made in this sentiment? To start with, I'd like to tell Honorable Mother we are not here to fight President Uhuru Kenyatta. We are holding him to account on his utterances. He has said he's going nowhere. He's on record. That's not fighting him. He has said he assigned Mother Karua the role to jail people. I don't know how she'll do it. She's not a judge. She's not a court of law. That is the work of courts of law to jail people. It's President Uru Kenyatta who has said so. He has said that uh, she has put her there to take care of interest. It's his own record. I don't want to respond to dignify ridiculous accusations by social media. Social media people assigned by the state, have been following me wherever I go in the Republic, including my homes, to listen to what I say and twist it. I told the people of Madeira, they asked me a question. Mr. Gashagwe, you bought a farm here and you have started building a house. What happened? Now that you are going to be Deputy President, are you still going to live here? I told them I stopped building the house because the state froze my accounts to intimidate me and to blackmail me to support the handshake. And that money is, is frozen. And I cannot use it. That is why the construction of a house stopped in this area. When the due process takes place and the courts will deliver justice to Rigadi Gashagwa one day and my accounts are frozen, I assured the people of that area that I'll come and complete that house and live with them. And I'll take time to allow them to come and visit me. They asked me a secondary question. As Deputy President, will you allow us to come and sit with you? I said, yes, I'm a junior elder in this community. I'll have time to sit with my fellow men over food, over a drink, and we share in the African way. I say the women in this area will come and sit with Mama Gashagwa and have Kesha because my wife is a pastor and she likes doing Kesha. 
And the women wanted to know, will they be allowed to come to the home of the deputy president to have Kesha with Mrs. Gashagwa? I confirmed, yes, I'll be deputy president, but I'm still the same old guy who hangs around here. A, right. a very generous person who spends all his time with the people. All right, Mr. Gashagwa, you have a national audience. What is the source of the money that was frozen? Because that is the context. Pardon? What is the source of this money that was frozen? Uh, I have said many times that I'm a victim of blackmail by President Uhuru Kenyatta, whom I served as personal assistant. President Uhuru Kenyatta wanted me to abandon William Ruto and join him in fighting him, and I said no, because he didn't give me a good reason. And he blackmailed me. He sent Nancy Gitao, his advisor, to threaten me that if I don't abandon okay. William Ruto and join him, I'll face the music from the state. Honorable and Gashagwa, one problem I... started after another. In they froze my accounts, KRI froze all my, com my companies, then they arrested me on trumped up charges for one and a half years, no evidence in court, nothing. I'm a victim of blackmail Hon and persecution by Uru Kenyatta using the state criminal justice system to manage politics and deal with those who don't agree with Hon you. Honorable Gashaga, with all due respect, you've not answered my question. What is the source of the money that was... The money that I have is well documented. I am an astute businessman. This is money that I made during the Regnum Waikabaki when the economy was thriving. I made over 200 million and invested in an account. And that account has been running for the last eight years and nobody has ever asked me a question. In 2013, when I supported Uhuru Kenyatta, I still had the money. In 2017, when I supported him, I still had the money in my personal account. This is money I have accounted for. It's clean money. I am a good businessman. And in the fullness of time, I'll be vindicated. I was really hoping that my colleague would uh, explain to us how an individual finds five billion shillings in their accounts. But I hope one day Kenyans will be able to know money that was transferred to his accounts in the last 10 years of the Jubilee administration. But that's for him to account. I believe as leaders, we have to be account accountable that is why there is declaration of wealth, so that as you enter office, people can know how much you are worth, and as you exit, or in the middle, they can monitor and see how you are progressing, whether it is from your salary, and if it's from business, it has to be a business that can be ascertained. I think we really need to come clean, because if you cannot account for your wealth, you cannot be a good steward of the money of the people of Kenya. So this is a question to both of you. You've brought up the subject of wealth declaration. Yeah. What are you worth, Honorable Karua? Um, I think about, uh, just about 150 million. And that is because the 56 million I had declared in 2013 has appreciated because of the inflation. I haven't had any new properties, but I'm a person many may not understand. I'm not thirsty for land. I'm not thirsty for worldly goods. I'm happy to have a house I call home. I'm happy to have uh, a house in my father's land. I do not look for property. Not everybody is hungry to amass. I'm hungry to do something to help my country to transform the lives of the people. Right. So if you are looking for Martha Karua to be a billionaire, no, I am not hungry for billions. Honorable Gashagwa, my how accounts much are you did worth? not receive five billion. That is propaganda. I have two hundred million. That is the money that is held. Two hundred million, sixty-four million. I worked in the Ministry of Lands and Settlement. Ten million. I worked in Kenya Power. 33 million, I worked in the Ministry of Livestock. Another 46 million, I worked in another organization called Patek. Up to 200 million, that is all the money. But when you set policemen to investigate, they don't understand accounts. When you save money in a fixed deposit, it leaves the, your personal account into a suspense account. A normal policeman looking at it, movement in and out four times a year, of 200 million, he thinks you have 800 million within that year. So when he multiplies by seven years, he says you have 12.4 billion. 
That is the folly of the kind of investigations we are having in this country. I don't have billions. I have 200, 203 million into that account. And that is part of my wealth. I'm worth 800 million minus the 200 they are holding, another 600. So just a quick follow up on that, Honorable Rigadi, because the charges you are facing are as a result of trading with county governments. What's your position on public officers doing business with government, whether at the national level or at the county level? By the time I've done all my businesses, I was not a public servant. I was a private individual. I have no conflict of interest. I was a businessman. I, made, I applied for tenders and competed, opened tenders and won, and did construction business and did supplies, and nobody is complaining. Today, those charges against me. No evidence in court. Nobody is willing to record a statement. Clean business. And I never traded with institutions because I was not part of any government. But this that is when is your business brother... I did in 2011. I did in 2012. You know? When they say that uh, my brother was governor, my brother became governor in 2013. I did business in 2008, in 2009, in 2010, uh, 2011, and that money is there, and it's all documented where it has come from, but nobody is bothered, because they just wanted to punish me. But they wanted to blackmail me mm -hmm. into supporting the handshake, and I'm a man of principle, and Uhuru Kenyatta knows that. I respect my conscience. I will never be intimidated, and I can tell you, many governors today supporting as me, it's because they were blackmailed like me, and they gave in. On Honorable Gashagwa, just clarity, in 2009-2010, there was no county governments. Which government did you do? Sorry? There was no county governments in 2009 I'm saying, I'm saying I made money in 2010, in 2009. There was no county tenders. government. I didn't make money with the county government. I never did uh, business with the county government. I said I worked with the Ministry of Lands. I worked with the Ministry of Livestock Development. So you cannot say that there was conflict in Nyeri because I did this business long before county governments came into place. But Honorable Gashagwa, the matter in court is about doing business with county governments. I'm saying the matter in court is a matter that is on fabricated charges. And that matter will be coming in the fullness of time. What I'm talking about is the money that is held and where it came from. As to the allegations as a matter before court, there is nothing. It's absolute lies. There is nothing. And in the fullness of time. And that is why, even after sending 200 policemen to arrest me in Nyeri and drag me naked in front of my wife, in front of my workers, drive me to Nairobi, lock me for four days, one and a half years later, not a shred of evidence, nothing. That is why the case has not taken off. They have slated it for September later this year. But still, nothing has been presented to us. Our lawyers have been asking, give us evidence against regarding Ashagwa. It's not forthcoming. It does not exist. It's a fabrication. It's blackmail. It was a way of trying to force me to abandon William Ruto. Okay. But I was not intimidated. I remain on board. Okay, Honorable Karo, you have two minutes. An Azimio government will have a policy position that graft cases and all serious crime should be investigated and prosecuted within a given time, within six months to be specific, so that people like my colleague here, Mr. Gashagua, anybody charged with crime against the people, within six months, we ought to know whether they are guilty or not, so that we don't, people don't seek public office when having baggage of cases. And if I may remind Mr. Gashagua, the cases, because I've been following the newspaper reports, uh, relate to Kuala County, Bungoma County, and Nyeri County. And the period when the offenses are said to have been committed is between 2013 and 2020. So it is important, even from a personal position, that a person gets cleared and that you do not uh, instruct advocates to delay the cases because what we are having in our courts is really a circus. Where one is charged, you are holding public office, you continue holding public office, elections come, and now we have seen new language in the courts that to allow them to campaign, the case is further delayed. Kenyans need to know, and even the person accused needs to know so that they do not give excuses. We have repeatedly said with my captain 
that whether it's my daughter, my blood relative, or a member of the op opposing camp, the law must apply equally to all. And everybody must have a swift chance to clear their name in court or for the court to declare them guilty. We are here to help. On allegations, a British newspaper accused her of receiving a bribe from BET. But I cannot come here and accuse her that she's corrupt because of that allegation. Because an allegation is an allegation. The people of Krenyaga have been complaining that she used her office as justice minister to take land in South Gariyama and give it to her relatives. But that is just an allegation. The issue here, Sophia, the issue here, we, Sophia, we would, we would like, the issue here, hang on, Sophia, hang on, hang on, is hang on, that we need to allow would, would like to remind the members of our audience to please do not cheer or jeer and allow our candidates to present their issues. Please go the ahead. The issue here is that we need to allow independent institutions to fight corruption. President Uhuru Kenyatta has cried inability to fight corruption because he was lenient. He was lenient because the people involved in mega corruption are close to him, both in family and friends. That is why he was lenient. But had he allowed independent institutions to fight corruption, the issue of leniency would not arise. Had he allowed independent institutions to fight corruption without getting involved, Rigadi Gashawa would not be in court because independent institutions will never take people to court without evidence. What, my, what the, uh, Honorable Karua is saying, that we need a law to, fasten, to hasten cases, is not the solution. Honorable the Gashagua, solution is, is to take cases to court when you have evidence. Matakura, you have a minute to rebut. I just want to let Mr. Gashagua know that I do not have an iota of public land anywhere, in Kirinyaga or anywhere. I do not own land in South Gariyama. I am glad he knows they are just allegations. And I challenged the current administration that is there, and I'm not in power in Kirinyaga, that if there is truth to that allegation, then they must swiftly take me to court and recover. So once you challenge those making the allegation and they don't do anything about it, then the matter is closed. I, the only land I own in Kenya is the house I live in in Nairobi and the house up country, which is on my father's land, and he has included my name in the title. I said I'm not land hungry, and I'm not hungry for material wealth. Those who are hungry may never understand that. Relating to BAT, it was money paid to my com uh, campaign secretariat by a donor, not paid to my personal account. Later, it transpired that it was money from a company. The matter has been investigated in UK, and the, the file has been closed. I also challenged the DPP of the government, Gashagua, Gashagua's principal serve, in 2016 to investigate and prosecute me. Right, so those time, matters time is are up. allegations. Thank you, thank you very much. Time is up. But now that we're talking about funds, uh, you all are traversing the country with choppers and legions of teams. How do you finance your campaign, Nurubu Gashagwa? How much does it cost? Pardon? How much does it cost to finance your campaign? Pardon? How much does it cost to finance your campaign? Oh, the sound is not working here. Sorry. I can't hear you properly. Apologies for that. Yeah. How much does it cost to finance your campaign? Well, it's difficult because uh, we don't have a centralized command. Our campaign, we are raising funds from people, and mostly is in materials, is in donations in terms of choppers, in terms of vehicles, in terms of fuel, in terms of personnel. And really, what you need in terms of cash is not much. This campaign of Kenya Kwanzaa is uh, bottom-up driven. A lot of hustlers have taken time to give their all in terms of time, in terms of materials, in terms of uh, support in kind. There isn't much about cash. Much, so it's very difficult at this stage to quantify and say this is the amount that we are going to use for this campaign. What I know is that in the next one week or so, we'll now be talking about real figures because we have to mobilize agents, we have to mobilize vehicles, we have to get people to protect the vote. Those people need to be given allowances. That is when now we will come to the cost of the real campaign. All right, well, Martha Karwa, the same question. How do you finance your campaign? Through public donations in cash and kind. We had a fundraiser just the other Friday, but the donations are a continuous process. 
the Azimio campaign secretariat is keeping tap. My personal campaign organization, the New Don't Trust, is also keeping tap of all donations coming to me. And it is the organization that had received the money you asked earlier for BAT. I do not mix campaign money with my own funds because you have to maintain integrity even with donations. We have choppers donated. There is a, a chopper I personally use, which is a donation from a kind corporate friend. And we have many such donations. And I want to remind Kenyans, my captain, the Honorable Raila Amolo Odinga, has had choppers in his campaign even when he was out of government, like the 2007. I think they flashed chop more choppers than the PNU side I was in that could have. He is a man known for his capability to mobilize resources, both human and financial, for campaign. And I'm very lucky to be his running mate. Talk to us, Honorable Gashagwa, about corruption and election campaigns financing. A lot of opaqueness there, clearly, even from this engagement, and laws around politicians being accountable and there being an eye inside what's going on have not seen day of light. So what are your thoughts? Is there any nexus there? Well, you know campaigns and campaigns, and you really cannot control donations because people support a certain candidate for a certain reason. And uh, it behoves upon the candidate to receive donations that are well-meaning and donations that are not tied uh, to your win and what you need to do to pe for people after. And that is the basis of our campaign. I personally have many friends uh, who are supporting me. They have not demanded anything for me in return when we form government. They think we have got a good plan. They think that we need to be given an opportunity uh, to run this country and turn it around. They think that uh, the real thing is the economy. They think that uh, they need to help us to move around the country. And they are well-meaning. I wouldn't say the same of my colleague here because their campaign is being run with the public resources. You are aware that the PS Interior has been meeting chiefs and assistant chiefs who are public servants and give them instructions to work for Azimio. You have seen their meetings being attended by chiefs in uniform. That is the misuse of public resources. We have seen funds from Harambe House, from the confidential expenditure, being put into this campaign. Many of the town, house, uh, town hall meetings they are holding in the Mount Kenya region all the delegates are given a thousand shillings to go home, and that is money from public office. Do you have evidence of this? Oh, yes. Uh, we have photographs, we have recordings, we have audios. They are there. We are always uh, are well appraised because many of those people who go to receive that money are actually our supporters. And they say they don't want to allow the elephant to die with the tusks. They need to remove the tusks before it is dead. That is what is happening. And public servants, the Cabinet Secretary for Interior is on record campaigning for Azimio. The Cabinet Secretary for ICT is on record campaigning for Azimio. These are public officials. They are, public, they are paid with public money, but they are campaigning. That is misuse of public resources. And, okay. I, my, and my colleague here, who says he's a stickler of the rule of law, has not condemned that because I would want her to condemn that because she says she's a stickler of the rule of law. And if she finds public resources are being used to propel her to office, she should be bold enough to say that is wrong. She should speak out against the misuse of chiefs and assistant chiefs by the peers in Tina okay. to campaign for her and her boss. Okay, Honorable Karua, just to build on that, all corruption scandals, Eurobond, Kimmerer, Afi House, Kemsa, do find a dotted line into politics. As you respond to this question, how does Azimio and yourself going to deal with these questions that we have to deal with now. May I begin there by saying that Azimio government is very clear on what it will do. Both my captain and I have repeatedly said there will be no sacred cows. Anybody involved in corruption will face the law, irrespective of who they are. As for campaigning with public resources, that's a publication. What I know is that every presidential candidate is entitled to security. So there will be security apparatus, whether it is the deputy president's campaign or the right honorable Raila Amolo Odinga. 
we mobilize our own meetings using our candidates, using everybody. Anybody who attends, they attend on their own volition. Yes, there are some cabinet secretaries who have attended our meetings, but they have sometimes attended as a by the way. When they attend deliberately, it's of their own volition and it's not because we need them to mobilize. Let nobody forget that there is no political operator who can mobilize more than the right honorable Raila Amolo Odinga. I also personally do not need help to mobilize. I've been in this game for 30 years. When Mr. Kashagwe was still a deal, I was in politics. All right. You have a response to that? Uh, One minute rebuttal. Well, I have no rejoinder for that. My request is that it's about time we move to the real issues that the people of this country need to know what is our plan. We have talked many issues, and that is a good thing. But the people of Kenya need to know what does Rigati Kashagwa and William Ruto have for them. I'm hoping that debate will come around tonight because it's important. Because many Kenyans are glued to the screens. They are waiting to hear. They want to know about health. They want to know about education. The public service wants to know about their issues. The police service wants to know about their issues. There are many people waiting. And I think I, I, must, I am guessing they must be getting on, on, yeah. on, on, on Robo Gashagwa, we are getting to that. And okay. corruption is a big issue in this country where public resources... Corruption, actually... corruption must be fought. And the real corruption is state capture and conflict of interest. What is state capture? State capture is where the people in power compete with citizens for scarce resources. Where the people in power use their position to advantage themselves to get business unfairly. Where people in power allocate resources to projects where they have an interest. I have an example. In the year 20, I want to tell you what is state capture and conflict of interest. This is a Gazette Notice Legal Number 1112, dated 26th June 2019. In the exercise of powers conferred by Section 106 of the Stamp Duty Act, the Cabinet Secretary of the National Treasury and Planning, on the recommendation of the Cabinet Secretary for Lands and Physical Planning, directs that the instruments executed in respect of the transactions relating to the merger of NIC, PLC, and Commercial Bank of Africa shall be exempt from the provisions of the Act. By a single signature, these two companies owned by the first family were exempted from paying 350 million. These are rich banks who have made money from domestic borrowing. They have lent money to government. They are in Fuliza. The owners are the richest people in Kenya. They were exempted from paying 350 million. Money that can put up 35 level 3 hospitals in Kenya. That is conflict of interest and state capture. That is coronic corruption. It's worse than the corruption associated with public procurement. And that is what we must deal with. Okay. We must deal with state capture. We must deal with conflict of interest. There okay. is a railway line between Nairobi and Nyanyuki that was put up at a cost of 3.8 billion. That railway line serves one company that supplies fuel to Nyanyuki. All right, Shagwa, thank you very much for this. Unfortunately, I cannot authenticate no, this it's document. Important. You I, ask I, me what the state comes I'm giving, I'm giving you time, but I cannot authenticate the document that you've just read right now. So yeah, yeah. I've seen in a manifesto that you would put a commission to yes. investigate these yes. tribes. Would you go after the first family? We will not go after anybody. We'll go after all those who are in state capture and conflict of interest. Who are they? But what are you saying? That will come out in the commission. I'm saying there will be a commission because the real corruption that we need to deal with, not what Honorable Mother is talking about, is state capture and conflict of interest, where the people in power have used their offices to usurp public resources to their advantage and to the disadvantage of the rest of Kenyans. You are aware that the milk industry has been monopolized by state capture and conflict of interest where the owners of that monopoly decide how much to buy from the farmers and how much to sell to the consumers. So, and 
and extort the people clarity, of Kenya. Cl clarity, that is clarity for, the, for the Kenyans who are watching, yeah. at the center of government yes. is President Uhuru Kenyatta. Yes. Are you going to go after President Uhuru Kenyatta finishes his term? I have said we are not talking about individuals. We'll deal with state capture and conflict of interest. Anybody but who is involved in state capture and conflict of interest you are will be held to account. The first family, sir. So grab the bull by its horns. Don't perhaps cut around the issue. You are talking about the first family. So in essence, you are saying you will go after them. Isn't that true? I am saying this is state capture. I've given you an example. <laughs> you will feel for yourself what needs to happen. All right. And I am saying that is what we need to deal with. You know, state capture. And that is why the president will say, he is lenient. He cannot deal with state capture. He cannot deal with conflicts of interest. Okay. He can't. Thank, thank you very much. Ramata, Ramata, two minutes. I want to help Mr. Gashogwa. State capture is the repurposing of the state to serve individuals rather than public good. And corruption cartels in this country, whoever they are, have strangled the country. I opened by saying Kenya can't breathe. Our health services, their money is taken, the money for agriculture, for fertilizer subsidies, money for building dams such as Kimwerel, Arol, Galana Kularu, which was supposed to help Kenya feed itself. That is what state capture is about, that every penny intended for the public, a majority of it is ending up in people's pockets. This is not about families or individuals. It's cartels, and cartels are organized people, gangs, of criminals, because what they are com doing is committing crime. And you don't need a commission to punish crime. You just need serious law enforcement. And if you find roadblocks that cases are taking too long, then parliament can be used to do its work, to consider proposals from the government, to pass laws that fast track such cases. We all know that election petition cases take six months. Why can't corruption cases similarly take such a period? That is the debate that must go to the National Assembly. Mr. Kashagwa serves in the National Assembly. I have not heard him talk about corruption except when defending his own position in the case he's involved in. In contrast, I'm out of parliament. I've been vocal whether it's Kemsa whether it's any other corruption. And I've also been vocal in upholding the rule of law and reminded my brother, President Kenyatta, that he cannot serve beyond his term, a position he holds at this moment that he is going home. So, Honorable Karua, do you agree then that there's state capture in Kenya? And, and secondly, what do you make of their proposal to form a commission of inquiry into the same in Kenya if elected? That just expresses, it expresses their reluctance to fight corruption. In fact, Mr. Gashagwa's principle is captured on tape in an interview in this country saying that corruption, he doesn't think corruption can stop a, a nation from developing. With what money will a nation develop, invest, or even provide services if the corruption cartels are taking two billion shillings a day? which translates to stealing 40 shillings from every person. In an average household of six people, that's 240 shillings, two packets of unga at the discounted price of 100. Kenyans need to understand. They're hungry, they're without medical service, without fees for their children, and without free education, because corruption cartels are strangling the nation. That's why we can't breathe. Once we understand that, then we will vote for people with a track record, like Azimio, people with a will to fight corruption, people who are prepared to confront the monster yep. and to apply the law evenly, irrespective of who is mentioned. So do you believe we have state capture in Kenya? There is state capture, yes, by corruption cartels, organized criminal gangs who plunder our resources daily. Two billion shillings a day, which is authenticated by the Auditor General, translates to 600, 765 billion shillings. The amount of money we need for the social support 
is just 144 billion. The rest can be used to pay debt, to do other things. We intend to seal all those loopholes so that Kenyans can have advantage of their resources. Honorable Karua, the names of every corruption scandal, Kimura, Kamsa, yeah. uh, Eurobond, they're all government officials. Yes. How do you deal with that? That is where the state capture is coming. If you look at them, it's not about families, it's about individuals who choose. Because I keep saying no mother has baptized their children, the name corruption. It's a behavior an individual deliberately chooses. And state capture can even become a tool during elections where empty promises are given to entice Kenyans to further surrender their sovereignty to uh, corruption cartels. Imagine Kenyans to look at the track record of each of the formations that are seeking the presidency of this country. I am confident that a reasonable look at the candidates present as Kenyans will commend themselves to vote for Azimio. And Azimio will do the jobs, not because we are perfect, but because we have the best track record and we do try and have tried before and done good work for Kenyans. All right, we have two minutes. I, I, don't, know. <laughs> I don't know whether the Honorable Mother has taken time in their meetings with the Chairman of Azimio to ask him. He said he is in charge of this country. He knows everything that goes on. Then he went ahead to, he went ahead to say that two billion shillings is stolen daily. I don't know whether in her meetings with the Chairman of Azimio she has tried to find out from him who steals this two billion and why he has done nothing about it. In terms of fighting corruption, our manifesto is very clear. Our plan is sound and is in accordance with the Constitution. Our plan is to allow independent institutions that fight corruption to be really and truly independent by giving them that freedom and giving them resources and financial autonomy so that they receive instructions from nobody. On assuming government, we shall appoint the Inspector General of Police as the accounting officer of the National Police Service so that himself and the DCI have independence to do what they need to do on fighting crime and corruption without having to take instructions from anybody. Because you know, this it is said, he who pays a piper calls a tune. Why the Inspector General of Police and the DCI cannot fight uh, corruption and crime, why they cannot operate the way the Constitution spells out is because they are controlled from Harambe House because that is where their money is. We shall give them financial autonomy. We shall operationalize the Judiciary Fund to allow our judges and magistrates to operate with financial autonomy so that they are free to do what they want to do, so that they can fast track cases without having to look back. And of course, you know, President William Ruto, the new president of Kenya, God willing, we appoint the judges that were nominated by the Judicial Service Commission so that they can serve the people of Kenya. All right, Honorable Karua, do you agree that lack of independence in these institutions is the problem Kenyans are facing in the criminal justice system? The Constitution gives all these um, institutions independence. And independence and autonomy should not be confused with accountability. Parliament, which is independent, has to be accountable to the people of Kenya. The executive has to be accountable to the people of Kenya. The judiciary has to be accountable to the people of Kenya. Institutions have decisional independence. That a judge will be independent in making that decision of guilty or not guilty. That the director of public prosecutions will be independent in deciding to charge, to prosecute or not to prosecute. It doesn't mean that they fail to account to the people of Kenya. And that is most of our leaders are failing to do. Be accountable to the people of Kenya. You go to office to do your own business, where you will find that quite a number of people who are parliamentarians are trading with the counties, are trading with the government. So who is the watchdog of the people? The law forbids it. Conflict of interest. Going to get count, um, county work from a county government when you are a member of parliament. 
who is going to be the watchdog? A quick follow-up on issues. that. Yeah. Because the proposal on the table in Azimio is that if you were elected into office, then you'd also double up as Minister uh, for Justice. Yeah. Wouldn't that go then to entrench that kind of feeling of interference from the executive? Because these are independent institutions, yes. But even if it's facilitating and good workflow, there's the NCAJ that handles all of the issues around that chain uh, of criminal justice. So wouldn't that role, in essence, be seen as interference as well? Not at all. The Minister of Justice doesn't prosecute. This is a coordinating ministry, coordinating the entire justice sector. And we had such a program even during the Kibaki time known as Justice Law and Order Sector to give policy direction. Then each institution goes and works on its own. It's not about how that institution will do its work. It's to understand together the difficulties, the roadblocks along the justice sector, so as to make proposals for legislation and for policy to parliament. Remember that policy and legislation are passed by parliament. Government institutions are independent, but they cannot act alone. There must be some synergy, and that synergy is in policy. Then they can have decisional independence. I've been a minister of justice before. I didn't investigate or prosecute. All right, I want to move to the next topic and let's go to the cost of living. One of the charges against politicians in this country is that they're simply out of touch and you're unable to solve the problems that we face. I'll give you an opportunity tonight, Honorable Gashagua, to start to make your presentation on cost of living by first telling us what is the cost of milk today? Um, the cost of milk, Retail. the farmer sells at 42, at the supermarket, some places 120 per liter, others is 130, depending on where the supermarket is. Kerosene? I don't go to the supermarkets. Okay. What, what is your presentation tonight on dealing with the cost of living, knowing very well that... I want to, I want to say, I, I'm happy now we are where we need to be. Audience, please maintain silence. And for the record, issues with what we've been talking about throughout, these issues impact on what, how we fund the projects and all of these other subsidies we'll be talking about. So there's no non issue tonight. What I'm saying is that I'm happy that we are discussing the high cost of living, the inability of Kenyans to buy food. Because a mistake was made maliciously to deny farmers fertilizer subsidy. And as a result, there was low production and because of the law of demand and supply, you cannot afford a packet of unga. A packet of unga is 250 shillings. Government is running around because of this election now, trying to subsidize for four weeks, just after the elections. But they are not telling the people of Kenya how they'll buy food after the elections. This is being done to entice them to vote for Azimio. If government had done the right thing and supplemented farmers, with inputs and fertilizer, they would have increased their production. You know, we consume 46 million bags of maize, and we produce about 40 million every year. We normally have a deficit of about six, which we import. But because of this decision, we are short of almost 15 million bags, and that is, that is what has caused the current crisis. And we have a plan. On our first month in office, we intend to bring down the cost of fertilizer from 6,700 to 2,500. That is DAP. That is the main fertilizer for planting. Okay. And that, that will enhance our farmers to produce more so that we have food security and probably we even have some surplus for export. Thank you. Honorable Martha, same question. What is the price of bread today and what is Azimio's plan to reduce the cost of living? The price of bread, the bread I buy, is 80 shillings. But there are various types of loaves, so I will not pretend to know what each loaf is costing. But I know that the price of foodstuffs, of essential commodities, has gone up, and the fuel prices are generally the trigger that gets them high, coupled with corruption. My friend... Um, Mr. Kashagwa is talking of giving 
their government giving fertilizer subsidies. He is in Jubilee and therefore part of Jubilee government. He is in parliament courtesy of Jubilee, but he doesn't know that currently the Jubilee government has a fertilizer subsidy and a bag is retailing at 2,900. The only problem is with the distribution because the cartels are making sure that they buy most of it. Only a poultry gets to the farmers. It's again sold at the higher price. For us, the first, second, and third agenda is to fight corruption. Governments have subsidies to cushion farmers because of, and to cushion the people because of a series of things. We have war in Ukraine, which has seen foodstuffs rise for countries that depend, are not self-sufficient and buy outside, Kenya being one of them, fertilizer and other things. But the money for subsidy, for helping our people with the cost of living, is going, majority of it is going to the cartels. That is where the problem is. The money meant for Galana Kulalu irrigation scheme, which could have helped with our food reserves was stolen. Kenyans knew even the fertilizer there was a scandal. Maize there was a scandal. Kenyans knew who are responsible for those scandals. And Mr. Gashagua is also aware. And together with this captain, they may know more. Uh, since my mother, since mother, who is actually my mother, <laughs> who is actually my mother, my late mother is Can Mother Kerego. Since she joined government, she has been consumed by the lies of the same government. If the Honorable Mother moved around the country, the lie she's giving here that fertilizer is 2,500, she would feel very sorry. If she went round to Kemunye, her hometown in Gishogo, the cost of DFE is 6,700, the cost of CAN is 5,900, the cost of 17, 17, 17 is 5,800, the cost of 20, 20, 20 is 5,900, and the cost of urea is 7,200. That was just a lie by the Minister for Agriculture. There is no fertilizer that is available for 2,500. You can walk around to any shopping center, including our hometown. These are the costs of fertilizer. And I want to say, let us stop deceit and lying to the people of Kenya on national television. When my sister here, mother, tells the people, farmers, that fertilizer is 2,500, they start having very serious doubts about her credibility as a future deputy president. Because if she can come here on national television and give prices that are not true, when people are suffering, when people cannot buy fertilizer, her credibility is put into question. A quick I've indicated rebuttal. that the subsidized fertilizer, he's correct, is not available at every retail shop, but it's avera available at the stores of the national, at the depots of national cereals and produce board. It is a project of the Ministry of Agriculture. I've heard the minister talking about it, and I know of farmers who have accessed it, but I know and I have stated it's riddled with corruption and it's not getting to the people. The honorable thing Mr. Gashagwa could do when you are not aware, you just say you are not aware. You just don't dismiss things as lies when they are happening. The problem with Kenya, money meant to cushion farmers, to cushion consumers, is going to corruption cartels. That is a big problem, and which, as the Mio government, will rescue Kenyans from. All right, I'm going to give you all one minute each to talk to first 100 days on how you'll deal with the cost of living. I'm aware 100% there is no fertilizer anywhere for 2,500. I'm a bottom-up man. I move around this country. It's simply not available. In the first 100 days, we want to do several things. One, bring the cost of food down, bring down the cost of living, bring fertilizer subsidies from 6,700 to 2,500. How will you do that, sir? As we'll uh, provide funds for that. The same, these funds that are being proposed now for bringing the packet of Unga down for 2 kg is what is supposed to go to fertilizer so that we have a long-term solution. The other one is not sustainable. It's a short-term thing for the elections. We have a plan to focus on primary health care where community health volunteers are given an allowance to boost their morale and increase their efficiency to deal with preventive medicine as opposed to curative medicine. 
we have a plan to employ 116,000 teachers within the first two years so that we can deal with the well, shortage we of the teachers. For that. I will explain to you. I have explained to you that we are stopping wastage in public spending. We have had a lot of projects that are not planned. Okay. We have legacy projects that are of sentimental values to leaders, but Thanks have up. no meaning to the people of Kenya. Thank you, thank you, thank you Rebecca. Yeah. So, your minute. I want to first say that we in Kenya do not have a revenue problem. This year alone, we collected over two trillion shillings, the taxman that is. We have a problem of expenditure, non-priority expenditure. That is what we are going to curb. With, in relation to fertilizer, the subsidies are already in place. It's a question of ensuring they work for the people. It's ensuring that the subsidy for UNGA continues to the time there will be harvest. The expenditure for operation and maintenance, O&M, is over 600 billion, while salaries are at about 550. You can see operation and maintenance of a shooting salaries. We will prioritize what needs to be prioritized to help Kenyans move forward. And for all the things we have said we'll do on a, in 100 days, I have acquainted myself with the budget. The budget lines are sufficient with optimal use. Mr. Kashegwa serves in the parliament that passed the budget. He doesn't seem aware that the, the money is in the budget, including for Baba Care. All right, uh, as we bring this to a close, fuel. The subsidy there expires next month, the same as the one we've seen um, on UNGA. We'll give you a minute each because Kenya Kwanzaa, you are proposing to set up a legal framework to rein fence the fuel stabilization fund. IMF World Bank says uh, stabilization funds are inefficient and regressive. Azimio, on the other hand, you're talking about reviewing the taxes and levies on petroleum products. So different positions here. So 100 days you come into office and there's all of this mess going on and the cost of living continues to be up in one minute. What is unique about this legal framework that you will do with the stabilization fund that hasn't happened so far? Uh, we have money available in the budget. Oh. We have money that has been put for projects that are not a priority. And that is the money that you need to inject quickly before you can even look at the legal frameworks on assuming government. And that is possible. Because you look at uh, the Minister of Agriculture, we have some 50 billion there. That 50 billion will be available to deal with the issues of fertilizer. It will be available to deal with the issue of animal feeds that are beyond the reach of many farmers. So that so we can have a quick win. Fuel stabilization fund in your manifesto, how will you fund it? The kitty is currently depleted. So you're not coming to find money. How will you fund it? We have said that uh, we are going to expand our tax base. Once we put the hustlers fund of 50 billion and we give to the people down there at the, at the down of the pyramid, we enlarge the people who are paying tax and will have more revenue. And this is the money that will be available to the people of Kenya. Number two, we are talking about the issue of domestic borrowing. We are paying 600 million every okay. year as interest from domestic okay. borrowing. Thank you. Right. Once we stop that domestic borrowing, this money that is going Thank you very for much. interest Honorable every Honorable month Honorable. Yes. will be Your available for this one. I'm glad he adopts my position that there's money in the budget, but that's as far as we go together. We part on how to do it. We will ensure that there is physical discipline so that non-priority spending is dropped and we go to priority spending. And I've given example of operation and maintenance, which is at 600 billion, while salaries are less than that. That is totally unacceptable. We will also fight corruption because money for fuel subsidies, there are a lot of cartels in the energy sector. We understand this. We will target those places and press the areas we need to press to immediately stop the leakage. Within 100 days, we will be able to do this and much more. We have actually been looking on what we need to do on day one because Kenyans are not going to be patient. They are already suffering. They cannot wait for commissions to be formed. They need actions. 
right. as the meal is ready to go. Ladies and gentlemen, our 90 minutes uh, debate is up. It's time for our closing statements. And we begin with you, Honorable Rigadi. You have your two minutes starting now. Thank you very much. I want to ask us to ask the people of Kenya to give us a chance to sort them out and put money in their pocket. We want to ask the people of Kenya to give us a chance to empower the small business people by giving them affordable credit to be able to expand their businesses. I want to ask all those people with pending bills to know that in the first 90 days, we shall float a bond for 500 billion to pay all the pending bills so that their homes are not auctioned. And by action, that 500 billion, by injecting to the economy, it will, it will spice up the economy. I want to tell the people of Kenya, by giving us a chance, we shall look at the terms of service for the public service and the police who are suffering and who need to work when they are comfortable. I want to tell the people of Kenya to give us a chance to bring reforms to the NHIF program so that every Kenyan has an NHIF card so that when you go to hospital, you are able to be treated and go home free. I want to ask the people to know, the people of Kenya, that William Ruto and I have a plan for them. I want them to give us an opportunity to work around this economy, to spearhead the third liberation, that is to bring economic changes so that we can create wealth, we can make the people of Kenya wealthy, we can give every Kenyan an opportunity to make a living, we can give every Kenyan an opportunity to make and live a good life. We want to ask them that on the 9th of August to come and foot for change a change to bring about economic development, a change to restore their dignity and to improve their quality of life. Thank you very much and good evening. Thank you. Honorable Karua, your two minutes start I now. want to remind Kenyans, this election is about trust. It's about looking to see which of the teams you can trust. We offer our track record. Because even when you employ a driver, you ask them for the driving license and you want to know about their record in driving. We are asking you to critically examine the teams and if you do so dispassionately, you will come to a conclusion. I know that Azimio is the team. We will not form commissions to fight corruption. We will go directly for the jugular of corruption cartels, apply the law, across the board, and while we agree that there is need to review salaries in view of the cost of living, it's very easy to promise heaven. Without fighting corruption, without physical discipline, non-priority spending being cut out, that is not possible. But in our Zekana, with an Asimio government, we are going to do this, and together with Kenyans, participating and helping us to fight corruption. We will be able to deliver our agenda to you, the 100 days agenda, and each item to reboot the economy so that Kenyans can have a decent life. While we wait to reboot the economy, for you who is unable to put food on the table, rescue is on the way. Within three weeks, you put an Azimio government in place, we are going to be able to send to the two million families that do not have any means of survival a 6,000 shilling package, which also will act as a stimulus to the economy because it gives purchasing power to two million families, which is like eight million people within the country. Rescue is on the way. All right. We shall finally have our country back. Vote as a male. All right, thank you very much, Honorable Martha Karua, Honorable Rigadi Kachaga. We've come to the end of our Deputy Presidential Debate 2022. I invite you to shake hands. Thank you very much, you've all done very well. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen in the audience and our viewers following this at home, we have come to the end of our debate this evening and our appreciation to Honorable Martha Karua of the Azimio La Umoja One Kenya Party Coalition as well as Rigadi Gashagwa of the United Democratic Alliance UDA for honoring voters with the duty uh, of agreeing to attend this public televised debate. We thank you. And we thank you for watching the final of our joint national debates. We'll come to you on Tuesday next week when Wahiga More, Raila Odinga, William Ruto, and George Wajakoya take this very stage in the presidential candidates debate. My name is James Maro of NTV. And I'm Sophia Wanuna of KTN News. Good night.